Good evening. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicines or Women's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Healthy Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey always strives to improve your well being through health education. According to the Federation for Peripheral Neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy affects approximately 30 million people in the United States and countless more around the world. It has many causes and can result in motor, sensory, and autonomic nerve damage. Tonight, we are joined by neurologist and director of the Merkin Peripheral Neuropathy and Nerve Regeneration Center, Dr. Amit Hoke, who will discuss what peripheral neuropathy is and outline ways to diagnose and treat it. So please use your Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to the doctor who will respond during the last 20 minutes of tonight's conversation. Our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. this evening. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance, and you can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout this year. And now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Amit Hoke. Good evening. Good evening, Kelly. Um, I want to thank you and uh, Hopkins at Home for inviting me to give this uh, talk. Our pleasure. So what I thought I would start with is a um, kind of a case presentation of three patients I have seen in my clinic over the years to describe how peripheral neuropathy can present in many different ways. The first one was a woman who complained of burning uh, in her feet for about three years. It started in her toes and slowly moved up her foot. Uh, the onset was very slow and it was worse in the evening when she tried to go to sleep. Uh, she had trouble doing that. Um, the other presentation was a 50 year old man who presented relatively acutely with uh, that started as tingling in his feet. Um, and uh, within a week he had trouble walking. He had some back pain um, he, and he had trouble breathing when he lay down. Uh, prior to the onset of this uh, acute illness, he had uh, a diarrheal illness. And then finally, um, I had seen a woman who was 29 years old and um, didn't have any history of uh, you know, peripheral neuropathy, uh, but um, she was um, never good at sports in school and uh, came with the complaints that she, uh, her balance was poor. She was tripping and falling. Um, she had a little bit of tingling in her feet, but no other major painful symptoms. And because she was adapted, we didn't have any family history on her. So these are people with peripheral neuropathy. And as you can see, the presentation of peripheral neuropathy can be very different. So what we mean by peripheral neuropathy? In the broadest term, peripheral neuropathy means disease or dysfunction of the peripheral nerves. And these are the part of our nervous system that exit from the spinal cord and extend into our limbs, to our trunk, and to the body, uh, the rest of the body. And peripheral nerves um, have unique structures. Um, I usually tell patients when I see them, Think of peripheral nerves are like cables in a house. They connect uh, your uh, basement, uh, the electrical panel in the basement, which is your spinal cord, to the rest of the body. And like the uh, electrical wires, they come in different sizes and shapes, and they have different functions. And also similar to the electrical wires, the peripheral nerve actually is composed of um, uh, individual structures called axons, which are actually an extension of the nerve cell from the spinal cord that extends all the way out to your muscle, to your skin, or to other internal organs. And then some of these nerve fibers are insulated with a, a sheet called myelin. And in a typical peripheral nerve, like if you think of your sciatic nerve, there are literally hundreds and thousands of these individual nerve fibers and along with the blood supply, they make up the big bundle that you can see. 
And when we think of peripheral nerves, we really think of the types of the peripheral nerves because based on what type of nerve fiber is affected, the symptoms of a peripheral neuropathy can be very different. Um, Typically, when I see a patient, if I uh, if the patient is complaining of muscle weakness or we, uh, wasting, that means that their motor nerve fibers are affected. If they have trouble with their bodily functions, that means that their autonomic nerve fibers are affected. And then if they have trouble with their uh, what we call large sensory or proprioceptive nerve fibers, they have trouble with their balance because these are the nerve fibers that goes to your joints and your muscles and give you the perception of space and where your limbs are. Uh, and then finally, um, we have a number of small sensory nerve fibers that goes to our skin and give us the perception of touch, temperature, pain, and so forth. So in typically, most in most peripheral neuropathies, these are the first types of nerve fibers that are affected. And often that's why the peripheral neuropathy can be quite painful. So Let's think about these nerve fibers and how they present in a patient. In majority of the time, peripheral neuropathy is going to affect the longest nerve fibers in the body. And that's why uh, symptoms typically starts on the feet. Uh, and um, as the disease progresses, the more and more proximal parts of the nerves are affected. And by the time it gets to about below your knees, uh, the patients often start to experience symptoms in their hands as well. We call this stocking and glove distribution type of a uh, presentation. And again, when we uh, see patients and trying to get history, I always go through these four different types of nerve fibers and ask what whether they have positive symptoms of those nerve fibers, which means are those nerve fibers kind of they are damaged at one point, but also at the same time, they are hyperactive, excitable, in which case they cause pain. For example, the small sensory nerve fibers, they can cause electric shock-like sensation, pins and needles. But at the same time, the patient may have diminished sensation in the same distribution. So the reason for that is, even though um, a small sensory nerve fiber going to your, for example, big toe may have degenerated and pulled back from the toe, but the rest of it is still connected to the spinal cord and up to the brain. It's almost like the patients who have phantom limb pain. So this nerve is no longer connected to your foot. So when you touch it, you may have reduced sensation, but at the same time, because it is still connected uh, to the spinal cord, that nerve fiber becomes electrically excitable and sends electrical impulses to the brain when it's not supposed to, but the brain is then gonna interpret that as pain coming from the big toe, even though that nerve fiber is no longer connected to that big toe. Um, when the large sensory fibers are lost uh, or degenerating, we get poor balance. So these patients walk like a drunk. Um, with the motor fibers, as I mentioned, you get muscle weakness and atrophy. But at the same time, you can get muscle cramps. So your muscles are much more irritable, um, especially if you get a little bit dehydrated. It's very common for people to feel twitches in their muscles or have full-blown Charlie horses type of uh, muscle cramps. Um, when the autonomic nerve fibers are affected, typically from the loss of function, you, can may, you may experience um, uh, constipation, um, or develop uh, lightheadedness when you stand up quickly. Um, in, in men, there's an erectile dysfunction and you may even lose sweating. Um, but at the same time, if the nerve fibers are hyperactive, you may experience excessive sweating in certain parts of the body and you may also have diarrhea. So who has peripheral neuropathy? This is actually a silent epidemic. Um, there's, you know, the number of patients with peripheral neuropathy um, dwarfs all the other neurodegenerative diseases. There are more than 30 million people uh, with peripheral neuropathy in this country alone. Um, diabetes is probably the single most common cause. So people with known diabetes account for about 50% uh, of uh, peripheral neuropathies. And then there are a bunch of other diseases that account to altogether maybe 20% uh, uh, of the rest. Uh, some of these uh, are 
common complications of chemotherapy drugs um, when we treat uh, you know, cancer and some other uh, drugs that are also toxic to the peripheral nerves. Um, sometimes uh, it can be infections such as HIV. Um, we don't see leprosy in this country, but worldwide, it is also a very common cause of uh, neuropathy. Uh, it can be inherited, but also it can be autoimmune. Uh, so um, in some uh, forms of uh, yeah, immune disorders, um, literally your immune system makes a mistake and attacks uh, your peripheral nerves. Um, that one patient I mentioned at the beginning uh, with uh, who was 50 years old and presented with acute onset uh, weakness and difficulty breathing had a disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So this is a type of a um, peripheral neuropathy where your immune system literally makes a mistake instead of fighting that diarrheal illness, goes and attacks your peripheral nerves. The good news with many of these is that they are, they are kind of what we call monophasic illnesses. That is, immune system makes the mistake, damages your peripheral nerves, but then it kind of resets itself. However, there are also chronic forms of that, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, in which case uh, we may need to use some immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, but apart from these typical peripheral neuropathies, any type of peripheral nerve injury or damage is considered a, a peripheral neuropathy. And um, you know, I'm sure you've heard of the term carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which is very common. There are millions of people who has it. Um, there's also another one called cubital tunnel syndrome in which um, a pinched uh, nerve at your elbow causes numbness and tingling in your fourth and fifth digits. Uh, radiculopathy means pinched nerves in your back or in your neck. Uh, again, there's millions of people uh, and obviously, traumatic nerve injuries is another uh, problem, especially during war. Uh, a lot of uh, veterans and uh, soldiers uh, uh, receive uh, nerve injuries uh, that uh, need to be treated. Um, but apart from these, the, one of the things that uh, we recognize in the last 10, 15 years is that some of the other more common conditions such as fibromyalgia or cystitis, um, these are diseases that we really don't have a good understanding of. But what we are recognizing is that in many of these, their peripheral nervous system is not completely normal. They often have kind of hyperactive peripheral nerves, especially their pain fibers are hyperactive. So one of the reasons why many of the drugs that we use to treat peripheral neuropathies seem to work for these conditions as well. So as I mentioned, those three patients, they all had peripheral neuropathy, but very different types of peripheral neuropathy. The first woman had what we call small fiber sensory neuropathy. And during her workup, we found out that she was pre-diabetic and um, she had basically a metabolic syndrome with hypertension, obesity. And so that was the cause of her um, uh, neuropathy. Um, if left untreated, this would continue to worsen and um, could uh, evolve into affecting the larger nerve fibers and could affect her walking. Whereas this uh, man had a full recovery uh, with appropriate treatment. Uh, and there are treatments that we can offer these patients during that acute phase within, if we catch them within the first two to four weeks uh, from the onset of their symptoms. But this other uh, young woman uh, had a inherited neuropathy called CMT, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. In fact, hers was what's known as type 1A, which is the most common form of this illness. So how do we evaluate patients with peripheral neuropathy? When patients come to our clinic, probably the single most important thing that we can do is to get a good careful history and I often tell the residents and medical students that at the end of the history, you should to have a good sense of what the diagnosis is and you should be correct in about 90% of the time. The examination and all the other ancillary testing that we do is really to prove or eliminate possibilities, but it's really the history that helps us narrow down the differential diagnosis. 
And the reason is there are over a hundred different types of peripheral neuropathies with different types of presentations, different associated symptoms. And so your history really needs to narrow it down. And then the next thing that we do is, uh, and uh, some of the patients who are in the audience today may have experienced this, we do nerve conduction studies and needle electromyography. Um, here's a typical example of a patient who's getting uh, an EMG nerve conduction study where we give little electrical stimulation into a nerve. In this case, it's the median nerve going to the thumb muscle. And um, basically we record how well the nerve is conducting that electricity. One limitation of the nerve conductions is that you can only check the integrity of the, what we call large myelinated nerve fibers. These are the nerves that have the insulation around them. They do not check the integrity of the small nerves that go to your skin, the one that are responsible for the painful symptoms. So how do we evaluate those patients? Um, so this is uh, something that was actually developed here at Johns Hopkins Hospital by our previous chairman, Jack Griffin, who also happened to be my mentor uh, about 30 years ago, um, where we can take little punch biopsies. These are three millimeter, one eighth of an inch, tiny punch biopsies that we can do in the leg and stain them, the skin uh, for nerve fibers. And these little nerve uh, endings that you see the fine thread-like uh, structure, these are all individual nerve endings in the skin. And when uh, there's a neuropathy, uh, these nerve endings initially show these swellings that are kind of pre-degenerative and eventually they kind of degenerate and disappear from the skin, in which case we can count the number of nerve fibers in the skin and tell a patient if they have a neuropathy or not by um, knowing that the density of those nerve fibers is reduced. Uh, apart from those two tests, there are sometimes additional investigations that we do depending on uh, what we think the differential diagnosis is. Um, I'll get into the blood work a little bit later, but the most important thing is basically extensive uh, panel of blood work that we do trying to identify treatable causes of neuropathy. So even if the patient doesn't have a history of diabetes, for example, we do blood tests to make sure that they're not pre-diabetic or they're not even diabetic, uh, that they didn't know. Uh, we check for vitamin deficiencies and so forth. Um, depending on the presentation, so in, if the patient has a more asymmetrical presentation or one side is more symptomatic, then we will do uh, MRI or ultrasound type of imaging. And especially if they have a history of nerve trauma, we can actually see these abnormalities in their nerves on the MRI scan. The other uh, type of test that we do is sometimes nerve or a muscle biopsy. And this is primarily being done nowadays to look for evidence of inflammation uh, in a nerve. These patients usually have a very different presentation and often they have um, abnormalities in their blood tests that hints that there is some sort of an inflammation going on in their blood vessels. And in, here's an example of one where the blood vessel gets inflamed and occluded, and that causes the nerve fibers to degenerate. Um, when patients present with the autonomic symptoms, we can do autonomic testing. Uh, for example, people who have lightheadedness or who pass out uh, when they stand up, we can do a tilt table test uh, to measure their blood pressure and heart rate. Um, we can evaluate uh, their sweat glands when we do the skin biopsy. Um, and rarely, we will do a spinal tap. And that's typically done in patients who present with an acute presentation, and we're suspicious that they have that Guillain-Barre syndrome type of a presentation. So I want to spend um, a couple minutes here uh, talking about how do we treat peripheral neuropathy. Um, so as I mentioned, the main thing that we do with the blood work is to identify the underlying cause of it. And because what thing we've learned over the years is that if we can identify the underlying cause and if we treat that, <coughs> we can slow the disease progression. And sometimes we can even completely stop it and reverse the damage uh, to the peripheral nerves. So as I mentioned, um, you know, if the patient is diabetic, uh, a stricter diabetes control and exercise regimen uh, and modifying their diet can really have a big impact on their peripheral neuropathy. Uh, 
If somebody has vitamin B12 deficiency, this is again, another common problem as we get older, um, we don't absorb vitamin B12 uh, as uh, well as we did uh, when we were younger. So it is common in older people to develop vitamin B12 deficiency and peripheral neuropathies are more common in older people. Um, another thing that uh, sometimes get overlooked is the excessive alcohol use. Typically, the risk for developing peripheral neuropathy increases if you've been drinking two glasses of wine per day for more than 20 years or equivalent of alcohol. Um, but even in patients who perhaps drink less than that, um, if they have a neuropathy, let's say from diabetes, if they keep drinking even a glass of wine every day, their neuropathy tends to progress more rapidly. So counseling the patients about alcohol use is important. Um, when we have inflammatory neuropathy, that is the autoimmune type of neuropathy, uh, we do have treatments. Uh, we can, uh, for example, do something called plasma exchange. We literally, we filter their blood uh, of these uh, abnormal immune complexes uh, to help them recover faster from their Guillain-Barre syndrome, or if they have the chronic form, we can uh, treat that. Uh, the chronic forms, we tend to treat with steroids or with an uh, immunoglobulin complex that is harvested from thousands of patients. It's called uh, uh, IVIG. Uh, and, and in more severe cases, we can use stronger immunosuppressive medications. Some of these are basically cancer treatments. But again, this type of neuropathy is relatively rare. Um, so then we're left with how do we treat people with, let's say, diabetic neuropathy with painful feet or idiopathic peripheral neuropathy that's complaining of pain in their feet. Um, basically, we have two approaches. One is uh, medications. The other is non-medications. Um, in terms of medications, um, you know, if somebody is fine with just taking occasional Tylenol or Advil, that's perfectly fine. But most patients would require some sort of a maintenance treatment. And when that happens, uh, we have to choose a medication from one of two classes of drugs. So the first two that are listed here, gabapentin and pregabalin, these are actually initially developed to treat seizures. So as I mentioned earlier, peripheral neuropathy, the reason patients have that painful symptom is because of excessive electrical activity in the peripheral nerve. So you have to think of peripheral neuropathy pain almost like a seizure of the peripheral nervous system. And that's why these seizure medications seem to work really well for those conditions. Um, but in some people, um, anti-seizure medications don't work. Uh, and one thing, again, empirically, we found that some of the um, antidepressant drugs seem to work really well. Um, one of these, uh, and you may see in ads on TV, is duloxetine or Cymbalta. And, and that, again, um, it's a medication that was initially developed to treat depression, but uh, it is nowadays more commonly used to treat uh, neuropathic pain. Obviously, we try to stay away from the opioids, but a small percentage of the patients, we may have to use opioid drugs uh, so that they can go on with their lives. Um, I usually tell patients that uh, with the uh, treatment is really the goal is trying to reduce their pain levels to a, an acceptable level. Um, to be honest, maybe 10% of the patients become completely pain-free. In fact, in clinical trials, when we evaluate the efficacy of these drugs, the goal is to reduce the pain levels by about 50% from their pre-treatment levels. Um, so, you know, the patients may have to accept some level of discomfort as long as it's more of a background noise to them than where uh, we consider that a success. Um, obviously, there are other types of treatments, uh, for example, meditation, uh, physical therapy for people who have balance issues or biofeedback uh, can be quite helpful. But one of the other things that we've kind of learned over the last 10, 15 years is the impact of exercise. Um, one thing we've, uh, we've done actually clinical trials in diabetic neuropathy patients have shown that 
um, a relatively rigorous exercise regimen, about half an hour of low impact aerobic exercise and half an hour of resistance training with weights or resistance bands uh, every day for five days a week um, can actually reduce the progression of neuropathy by about 50% in diabetic patients. So that's a big impact uh, because Currently, we don't have any drugs that can stop the nerve degeneration. You know, you treat the underlying cause, but despite that, sometimes the neuropathy progresses. And so the exercise is really the only way we have to treat that. Um, obviously, most patients with peripheral neuropathy are not going to be able to jog or run or even doing bicycle is uh, difficult. So Typically, we usually recommend swimming if they can do it. That's the ideal kind of non-weight-bearing uh, aerobic exercise. But a stationary bicycle is also not bad, and most patients can do that. Uh, for people with uh, balance issues, uh, again, as we get older, uh, the main thing is to prevent falls. So um, uh, again, in clinical trials, people who have done Tai Chi type of balance exercises or physical therapy balance exercises have been shown to reduce the risk of falls. So with that, I want to kind of um, talk a little bit about research in this area and what we are doing at Johns Hopkins Hospital along with our collaborators around the country. Um, so one of the problems is uh, with the peripheral nervous system, unlike other tissues, is that um, you know even though the peripheral nerves have a capacity to regenerate and repair themselves, unlike the brain or spinal cord, it, it's not a, an efficient and uh, effective process. Um, and we really don't have a good understanding of the exact molecular mechanisms of how different diseases cause neuropathy and, and how this uh, repair and regeneration process can take place. Um, we're actually really good at regenerating peripheral nerves in mice, but we haven't been able to translate those successes into humans. Um, and again, we don't have any effective treatments that deal with that underlying mechanism of axon degeneration, but that's changing. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about that. So as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of people with peripheral neuropathy, um, more than Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and all the other diseases combined. And yet, um, NIH spends literally less than $5 per year per patient who is affected with neuropathy. Um, and uh, because of that, um, we don't uh, have a lot of young people going into the field. Um, and, um, and even the big pharma uh, hadn't been very interested in uh, peripheral neuropathy treatments. And part of the reason is, you know, it's not a deadly disease like uh, some of the other uh, illnesses that I mentioned. And I had seen this uh, cartoon in New Yorker a number of years ago, and, um, and I'll spell it out. It says, unfortunately, there's no cure. There's not even a race for a cure. And we're trying to change that. So what are we doing? Um, about uh, three years ago, with a generous donation uh, from a patient of mine, we've started the Merkin Peripheral Neuropathy Nerve Regeneration Center at Hopkins, really with the primary goal of um, promoting um, uh, the careers and attracting young investigators to the field uh, and supporting their high-risk, high-reward uh, research ideas. Uh, we've started a, a precision medicine center of excellence in peripheral neuropathy. And along with that, we've set up a new collaboration with the New York Stem Cell Foundation uh, to really generate the tools that we need uh, to um, better study disease mechanisms uh, using patient uh, cells rather than trying to model things in mice. Um, We've partnered with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy that is also another patient advocacy group uh, that had been funded, uh, founded by one of my patients years ago. And uh, we've created this peripheral neuropathy research registry trying to identify genetic causes of idiopathic peripheral neuropathy. As I said, about 25% of patients are still we don't know what's caused their neuropathy, and we suspect they have 
kind of a complex genetic risk factors for developing peripheral neuropathy, but we don't know which genes are involved in that risk and how we're going to diagnose and identify those patients. Um, so we've, we're actually, uh, we've enrolled about 2,500 patients in that registry, and we're partnering with uh, colleagues in the genetics department at Washington University, trying to identify um, these uh, important genes and molecular pathways that causes uh, nerve degeneration as well as neuropathic pain. Um, I'll tell a little bit about uh, what we're doing with uh, some of the uh, young uh, biotech companies who are actually developing disease-modifying targeted therapies. So with the Perfin Nerve uh, and Nerve Regeneration Center, we really had a very aggressive goal of changing the disease uh, over the next 10 years. Um, we've started with the um, as I mentioned, the seed funding uh, to attract uh, young investigators to the field. Um, we are uh, expanding our network um, uh, with uh, other investigators uh, in the field in other institutions, not just within um, United States, but also elsewhere. Um, in the next couple of years, um, we're going to have um, uh, translational research and and. Um, things that we can actually move into patients. And then I'm hoping that um, in the next uh, six to seven years, we're going to actually have treatments uh, that are going to be uh, disease modifying and not just masking the symptoms of people with neuropathy. Um, as I said, so far we've um, supported uh, 28 uh, projects um, uh, of uh, young investigators. Um, uh, we've held our first symposium last year, and the next one is actually on March 22nd, and um, it is actually accessible uh, online um, through our uh, center, which I'll have the website at the end of the slide deck. <coughs> In our, uh, one of our goals is over the next uh, year is to recruit a faculty um, that uses uh, big data analysis and artificial intelligence. Um, obviously, you may have seen in popular media that artificial intelligence, um, you know, has good applications and also potentially bad applications. But in medicine, it really is changing how we do things uh, from early detection to treatments. And our uh, focus is going to be in this part where we're going to try to utilize uh, artificial intelligence to improve our research and accelerate the research so that we can uh, do um, drug screening in a more uh, efficient way uh, when we have a molecular target. So what is on the horizon? As I mentioned up to now that I said there's really no treatments for peripheral neuropathy, but that's changing. Um, and I want to tell you about three uh, kind of success stories. So um, I want to kind of um, tell you a little bit about what we've learned over the last 20 years, but more so in the last 12 years about the molecular mechanisms of axon degeneration or nerve degeneration. So there's a term called Wallerian degeneration that was actually described by Augustus Waller back in 1850, where he cut the uh, nerves of uh, frogs and identified that they degenerated distally um, in a very stereotypical manner, and then the proximal part would start regenerating. So the molecular mechanism of this degeneration is now known, but in the last uh, you know decade, my lab and several others have actually shown that the type of degeneration that we see in uh, peripheral neuropathies, which we call the, this dying back axon degeneration, actually share the same molecules as this process, so that anything that halts or stops this is going to be applicable to our patients as well. And this is a complex um, kind of molecular uh, scientific slide, but I want to uh, tell you two important things and how this is important uh, for our patients. So one thing we learned in the last 10 years is that there's an enzyme called NMNAT2 that our nerve cells in the spinal cord synthesize and rapidly transport down our peripheral nerves. Uh, this enzyme 
actually makes a protein or, or a metabolite called NAD, which is a precursor to ATP, which is basically the fuel that um, fuels all of our, uh, energize all of our cells. Uh, so you need your ATP in order to function. <coughs> And NMNAT2 has a very short half-life. That means that it needs to be constantly re replenished. So when you cut a nerve or injure it, the distal part of the nerve, that NMNAT2, gets rapidly degraded. And when that gets degraded, it activates another enzyme called SARM1, which further degrades the available NAD and causes axon degeneration. So because this is an enzyme that can be inhibited, we are uh, now racing to develop inhibitors of this because we think the inhibiting this should be able to block many types of nerve degeneration. And in fact, in the last 10 years, we have shown that in people with peripheral neuropathy, kind of similar process happens. They don't have a direct trauma, but Anything that affects the transport of that NMNAT2 leads to deficiency of the NMNAT2 in the distal axons. That's why it happens in the longest axons. In your feet, it's the longer, so there's less of NMNAT2, and there's more chance of someone activation. Um, so uh, right now, there are uh, three companies that are uh, in what we call phase one clinical trials that are developing these Salmon inhibitors. <clears throat> um, another success story actually was another company that took a different uh, path in terms of developing non-opioid painkillers. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, when you injure your peripheral nerve or if you have neuropathy from diabetes, uh, what happens is the nerve cells uh, upregulate um, these um, sodium channels, um, NAV 1.7, 1.8. These are um, proteins uh, that are like channels in our nerve cells and allow these electrolytes, sodium electrolytes uh, to pass through. And uh, when they are upregulated in our peripheral nerves, the nerve becomes electrically excitable and more excitable. And that's why the patients uh, experience increased pain. Uh, so for about 20 years, multiple companies tried to develop uh, inhibitors of these um, channels. Unfortunately, none of them were successful, except um, a company called Vertex announced successful results uh, from their phase three trials uh, at the end of January. So they are going for FDA approval, and uh, I suspect that their drug is going to get approved by FDA over the summer. And so we will have a truly a new drug to treat pain that doesn't rely on opioids. And their um, same drug was also effective in diabetic neuropathy trial as well. And finally, um, we have gene therapies that are coming uh, down the line. Um, you know, there are many different types of genetic neuropathies, and we already have uh, successes in treating a different type of a neuromuscular condition called spinal muscular atrophy. These were, you may have seen uh, stories on popular media uh, on those kids who used to die within a year or two of diagnosis uh, with gene therapy. Now they can live. Um, there's a rare type of a inherited neuropathy called TTR amyloid neuropathy, where we can actually use a treatment called antisense oligos to block the effect of the um, uh, abnormal uh, gene uh, using gene silencing. And then um, you may have seen the news stories about uh, gene editing in a living patient uh, using this new technology called CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, so um, this hasn't been applied to uh, inherited neuropathies, but I think uh, clinical trials are actually being designed uh, where we can uh, do the gene editing in patients who have genetic types of neuropathies. Those are coming down the line. In fact, uh, just very recently, um, together with our collaborators at uh, National Institute of Health, uh, we uh, developed um, 
We were part of a team uh, that developed a gene therapy for a very, very rare type of uh, neuropathy called uh, giant axonal neuropathy. There are probably less than 100 people, 100 kids in the world with this illness where they get this swellings in their peripheral nerves. And often uh, by the time they're teenagers, they end up in a wheelchair. Uh, and now we have a um, gene therapy that uh, slows the disease progression in these kids. And it's too early to see the full results of this, but even in the short uh, three years uh, of studying these patients, uh, we can see the impact of this gene therapy. So with that, I just wanna uh, kind of entertain questions from you guys. Um, as I mentioned, we, our center is really at the forefront of uh, developing uh, new therapies for this, but also creating a community of scientists who are gonna be working for this over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And I will um, you know, put uh, this uh, final slide uh, with, that links to our neuropathy center. And uh, you're more than welcome to listen in to the symposium that we're going to have uh, in um, next week, actually. So I'll stop there and leave this slide on. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Hoke. Lots of information. Wonderful, wonderful information. Uh, we do have quite a few questions. So do you want to just dive right into it? Sure. Okay. Um, let's start off with this first question from Susie. It's late to know is, is high inflammation in your body a sign of peripheral neuropathy? Not necessarily. Um, you know, patients can have, uh, signs of inflammation. Like, you know, one of the common tests that we do is something called sedimentation rate or mm -hmm. C-reactive protein. So those could be elevated for many other reasons, and it may or may not be the cause of a neuropathy. Um, it often when there's inflammation causing neuropathy, it's typically there's an underlying rheumatological condition. So one of our screens is looking for rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's, and so forth. So again, just inflammation by itself is not sufficient to blame it on that uh, as a cause of neuropathy. It has to be part of a, a broader uh, recognizable disease. Thank you. So it seems like you need to rule out a few other things. Exactly. Yep. Before you get to that. Okay. Our next question. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Hoke, uh, from Minnie. And she'd like to know, are there any new treatments for people with MS who have neuropathy? So the MS is different than peripheral neuropathy. In MS, there's a... Um, immune attack and the myelin and the nerve cells within the spinal cord or in the brain. Very, very rarely, and I've seen only two patients who had an inflammatory neuropathy, the CIDP that I mentioned, as well as MS. Um, unfortunately, the treatments for MS don't work for CIDP and vice versa. So again, we don't understand those differences, why the immune attack in the central nervous system is different than the immune attack in the peripheral nervous system, but clearly they're not the same. Right, yeah. I would think that would be a very hard one to figure out um, for someone who has MS. And my guess would be then to talk to their physician and yeah say I'm having this other pain, doesn't seem to, my medication or the issue doesn't seem to be calming down and maybe they need to be you know, tested then separately. Would you recommend that? Exactly, yep. I mean, sometimes I see patients with MS who have relatively common things like carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, They have a hand pain, they don't know why it is there um, and doing a simple nerve conduction studies, for example, can easily identify something more simple uh, than attributing their painful symptoms to their MS. Right, right. Thank you. Pretty tricky, these nerves. Um, okay, our next question from Connie. Um, so she uh, would like to know, is there any relationship? I want to kind of put two people's questions together from Connie and Heather. Um they want to know if there's a relationship between menopause and neuropathy. So I'm assuming they're asking, um, you know, does it become more aggressive, more 
you know, as you go through menopause or after menopause, or does it come on after menopause? I think those are the, what, what they're trying to ask here. So um, the incidence of neuropathy goes up as we get older. So by that definition, I think, you know, postmenopausal women are going to be at a higher risk of developing neuropathy compared to when you're in your 20s and 30s. But there hasn't been any strict relationship with the menopause itself as a cause of neuropathy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question is, let's say you are diabetic um, in your 40s and have neuropathy, you go through menopause, your symptoms may increase in the sense that you may experience more pain during the menopause with all those hormonal fluctuations, with the high flashes that you get. But that doesn't mean that menopause is causing nerve damage. It's just maybe heightened because your nerves are heightened at that time. Exactly. Just exactly. Times. Right. Right. Yeah. I, that's, that's understandable. And that's, I think women get that every month before they go through menopause, they, everything's get, gets heightened. Exactly. Um, okay. Our next question. Thank you for that, Dr. Hook. Um, so Heather, um, Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, Susan, she wants to know, um, what about therapeutic massage? So if you already have um, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, is therapeutic massage, is that helpful or does it, is that too much stimulation? Um, you know, I've had patients who couldn't tolerate it and I've also had patients who like it. Um, usually my advice is with massage, if it makes their hands and feet, their legs feel comfortable, go for it. Um, mm -hmm. it's not going to do any harm and, but it's not going to change the actual nerve degeneration that might be happening there. It's more of a symptom treatment. If it makes their nerves relax, that's perfectly fine. But I also had some patients who really could not um, tolerate the touch of another uh, or pressure of uh, external pressure. I mean, I have some patients who can't even wear socks uh, or right. shoes. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just, so I was going to, that's another question coming up. So, so this, you know, peripheral neuropathy can be, you know, really debilitating, like you're saying to the point of even, you know, clothing, there's a thin layer of clothing that they can't even tolerate. Yep. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, or at night, um, the, I have patients who couldn't tolerate the weight of their sheets or, uh, covers, um, Goodness. And yeah. have to keep their feet out. And then at the same time, some patients have the opposite problem. Their feet feel cold all the time. You know, they put on two socks to go to bed and mm -hmm. you really don't have a good uh, understanding of why that's the case, because by you know, objective measurements, like with nerve conduction studies and so forth, their neuropathy seems to be exactly the same. And yet the perception of each patient could be extremely different. Right. So is there a correlation between somebody who just in general has, you know, cold hands and feet or, you know, lower blood pressure, um, you know, to, is, that, is there a correlation or is that kind of a sign like they may end up with some type of, you know, peripheral neuropathy or no? No, not really. They're just I mean, completely opposite. They're totally yeah. unrelated things. Yeah. Um, some people just tend to feel cold all the time. I mean, in, there's mm -hmm. gender bias that woman tends to have more cold feet compared to men and, and especially postmenopausal women. But that doesn't mean that they are at higher risk of developing neuropathy. In fact, in the overall population, uh, even among the uh, elderly, the uh, prevalence of neuropathy between men and women is about the same. Maybe men is slightly higher, actually. Interesting. Yeah, well, good. I, I hope that you men out there that are listening just heard what Dr. Hoag said about that women tend to have cold hands and feet <laughs> in general. In general. In general. Okay. Um under our next question from Betsy, um, she would like to know, do pads with electrical stimulation to the soles of the feet, will this help with peripheral neuropathy? So um, 
there hasn't been, unfortunately, any good randomized placebo-controlled trial that shows that they actually work. Um, they're not going to do any harm. And when patients ask me if they should try it, I said, if they work as even as a placebo because they have no side effects, I'm perfectly fine patients trying it, but don't expect miracles. Yeah. Uh, often when they provide some relief, it's short-lived. Right. That's uh, unfortunate that it's short-lived, but at least they get a little bit of relief. Exactly. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Kimberly would like to know um, if someone is diabetic and menopausal, especially with tingling in the hands and feet, uh, do you recommend, uh, uh, is it, is it gallopant, gallopantin mm -hmm. or I'm, I'm sure this is a hard one for you to answer because you have, you would need to see this person in order to diagnose that. So is she asking if she, she if should she, go uh, on gallopantin. gallopantin. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think she should definitely have an evaluation, uh, mm -hmm. by a neurologist and it baseline should get nerve conduction studies. Um, as I mentioned, uh, sometimes like the simple things in the hands, the pins and needles could be from something like carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital tunnel syndrome, right. and in which case the treatment is very different, you know, wearing braces or maybe having surgery rather than taking medications. Right, right. I mean, I would imagine it can mean a lot of things. I mean, I, I know pretty much every day I get some kind of tingling in my hands or feet or whatever, you know, they could be falling to sleep or I've had have exactly. a certain position or, you know, I've worked out or whatever. So um, I, I would think that it, you really have to process of elimination. And and also you really, the, you think about peripheral neuropathy when symptoms are persistent every day, not just here and there, come and go type of symptoms. Right, right. So um, from uh, back to another question from Minnie. So she would like to know, does the use of ice packs diminish the sensations? Um, so I guess she means, is this approach further damaging the nerves by diminishing or, it, or, or is this approach further damaging the nerves by blood flow? Um, no, it is not damaging. And again, as I said, uh, some patients who have a lot of the burning type of sensation in their hands and feet sometimes use those um, ice gloves or, um, you know, uh, socks, uh, kind of booties that they can put uh, uh, ice cubes in it. Um, again, many of these things, um, even if they work as a placebo effect, um, you know, in clinical trials, when we do drug trials, Placebo has a 30 to 40% effect. So, which means when you believe in something that's going to work, it works. Uh, again, we don't understand. It has to do with the brain chemistry um, mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, interactions between different nerve types in the brain. But um, so if it's making the patient's uh, hands and feet more comfortable, perfectly fine to try it. Um, you're not doing any harm. Right. When uh, when should you actually go see a neurologist um, about if you start to have you know this tingling in your hands and feet? I mean, there when do you you know finally get to that moment? I mean, is it when you you're starting to lose your balance? Is it a combination of things? I mean, I wouldn't wait until you start to lose balance. I think you really if you have. Um, regular everyday um, tingling pins and needles in your feet uh, going on for a month or two, you should see your uh, doctor. At least see the primary care doctor. They can do some very basic examination, rule out things, and also order some basic blood work. Right. And Dr. Hook, when you're talking about pins and needles, because we all kind of get that, again, you know, like hands falling asleep or your hands are too cold and, and all of that. What kind of level are you talking about with this tingle? You know, when you, when you say the, say the words, you know, tingling sensation and pins and needles, there's various levels of that. You know, if you did the one to 10 scale, right. So when, when would you, you know, recommend somebody to, you know, like to say, okay, I really need to get this checked out. 
I think I usually, so every patient, um, you know, you can take a scale, that one to 10 scale, and everybody will um, grade it differently, even if they mm -hmm. have exactly the same neuropathy. So to me, the what I usually tell patients is when it interferes with their daily activities. So if you have trouble falling right. asleep um, or you can't walk, like if you're used to walking, let's say a mile a day, and now you can't walk even a block, that means that it is interfering with your daily living. And that's a point where you should go seek uh, medical attention. Right, yeah, makes absolute sense. Um, Barbara would like to know, does light therapy help with neuropathy? Um, again, it's the same thing, same answer with the electrical stimulation. There hasn't been any uh, good randomized trial so if it works, it's probably most likely a placebo effect. Uh, there isn't really good scientific rationale that it should work. Mm -hmm. Right. If it's working, I'm like, go ahead and do it. Yeah, it's painless, no side effects, better than medications. Right. Um, and speaking of that with medications, I just want to talk a little bit more on, um, you mentioned it in your presentation, but about taking the antidepressant drugs and um, if the anti-seizure drugs aren't working or you're getting uh, you know, side effects from them, um, just discuss a little bit more on that, that um, you know, the understanding that you're, you're taking these at a whole different level than someone who's taking these for depression. You want to speak on that? Yeah, I mean, there's um, there's two aspects to that. There's obviously sometimes some people think of it as like there's a stigma associated with taking antidepressants, <clears throat> but hopefully in this day and age, um, that's really not a big impediment to taking these medications. Um, the, and then the doses that we use uh, is actually much lower uh, than the doses needed to treat depression. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we don't understand the exact mechanisms of how these drugs work, but they seem to, uh, again, suppress that electrical activity in the nerves, uh, at least in mouse models. I mean, we haven't been able to test it in patients. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, I also tell patients that, um, you know, being in chronic pain by itself can cause what we call reactive depression. So it's just like, you know, it makes people miserable. I mean, this yeah. is really it can be a life altering uh, disease. And, Very true. you know, it doesn't kill people, but it can make their I mean, I've had so many patients, um, you know, cancer patients, for example, who develop really painful neuropathy from cancer who said, I wish I had died um, rather than continue to live like this. Yeah. Yep. Uh, on that note, and be because patients who do go through, um, chemotherapy and other treatments, as you mentioned, they tend to get the, the neuropathies and then they do take the medication. Let's say they take, let's say it's antidepressant medicine that's working for them. Do they need to stay on that then forever or actually anybody who has a neuropathy? In other words, if you went off of it, you know, does it end up coming back or is this something, you know, you need to be on for life or is it trial and error? A little bit of both. Um, so in the sense that uh, it depends on the underlying cause of the neuropathy. For example, in chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, even if we don't give any treatment, about half of the patients, once you remove that ongoing damage the, from the cancer drug, they tend to improve, especially if they had a mild case of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you may give them... Um, medications like gabapentin or duloxetine for a couple months or maybe six months a year, and then they may not need it. But mm -hmm. somebody with uh, idiopathic neuropathy or diabetic neuropathy may need to remain on it for a long time and right. lifelong sometimes. And I would think that's not harmful because it's giving them the quality of, of health and, and that they need, you know, for their life, right? Exactly. Like you mentioned earlier, it keeps them out of also being depressed because they're in so much pain. Yep. And, and again, you know, when patients are in pain, they don't exercise. Mm -hmm. So I usually tell patients, you know, take the medication, make yourself comfortable so you can exercise, which is in the long run is going to have a better uh, impact on their neuropathy progression. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, the body has to move. Exactly. Yes, 
All right. Well, listen, Dr. Hoke, we are close to the eight o'clock hour, and I want to thank you so much for speaking with us this evening. And uh, Dr. Hoke has graciously agreed to respond to any of our unanswered questions that were asked this evening. So in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email with the answers to any of the outstanding questions. And in the coming weeks, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey under videos on demand. And if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for more information about upcoming live programs, our webinars, our podcasts, and our monthly emails. Thank you for your time tonight. Good night and stay well. Thank you.